Uh, we're very lucky to have Lloyd McKenzie here today. So Lloyd is a globally recognised expert in the HL7 standards community and one of the original contributors to FIRE. So I'm not sure that I can do an introduction justice, but um, let's just say we're very lucky to have Lloyd with us today to present on FIRE questionnaires, maps and simplifiers. Simplifiers, sorry. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Lloyd. I'll pass the floor over to you. I'll stop sharing and you should be able to pick up the screen. All right. I'm just, hmm. hold on. I'm not on the camera that I thought I was going to be on. So let's see if we can see that. from somewhere. Yeah. And in the process of putting the right camera on, I knocked it over. That's okay. We've got to look at your Excellent. Keyboard. Yay, technology. <laughs> um, hi. So let me share my deck. And we'll get things underway. Great, we can see it. Thanks, Lloyd. Marvelous. All right, um, so I'm going to talk to you primarily uh, about questionnaires, um, but we'll spend a little bit of time on mapping uh, between structures and we'll talk a little bit about simplifier. And I'm happy to talk about whatever you like. So feel free to ask me questions uh, at any point. I don't mind interruptions and in fact, if you don't ask me any questions, we're going to have time at the end. And then you're going to be subjected to me talking about whatever I feel like, which is probably not in your best interest. Um, questionnaire uh, is the resource in FHIR uh, that we use to represent uh, forms. And questionnaire response is the resource that we use to represent responses to forms. And forms exist everywhere in healthcare. Uh, you fill out forms when you first show up. Uh, there's forms that may be filled out uh, sometimes for insurance purposes. There are surgical checklists. There are adverse event reporting forms. There are enrollment forms in various programs. Uh, there's paperwork that you need to fill out to apply for a provincial health number, to record a birth. They exist all over the place. Uh, and so we needed to have a way in FHIR uh, to represent uh, that kind of a concept. One of the reasons uh, that forms are attractive and that questionnaire is attractive is there are now over 150 different resources in FHIR. And I'm assuming that all of you have heard about FHIR at least a little bit, otherwise this is gonna be kind of confusing. But we have resources for allergies, for family history, for care plans, for health conditions, um, all kinds of things. And each of those resources has data elements and sometimes they have complex structures under them. And that's a lot of stuff to support. And a lot of data capture tools are not that smart. Uh, they just want to capture their five questions or their 15 questions or whatever it is and be done. And the fact that some of those questions live in the allergy world and some of them live in the medication statement world and some of them are demographic questions and some of them are family history questions is a lot for a simple system to deal with. And so it's kind of appealing to be able to dump all of that, those answers into a single resource that has a very simple data model of here's a question, here's an answer. Here's another question, here's another answer. And you can gather anything that you can imagine using that structure. And so it's, it's attractive and desirable. Uh, forms are also useful from a few other perspectives. Uh, in the research space, you often wanna have really tight control over how questions are framed and even the public health space and, and certain other areas of medicine, you really want to ask the question in a consistent way and display the answer choices in a consistent way. And if you have multiple questions, ask them in the right order, because how you frame the question, what answers you display, 
uh, what order you ask things in will change uh, what uh, results you get. And then if you're inconsistent in your framing of questions, you are inconsistent in the data that you capture and that makes it less useful for making decisions. Um, it's also helpful to just have things display in a familiar way uh, so that a user, regardless of which system that they're, they're using, is going to have that same experience of uh, what information is being gathered. And you also have control over exactly what level of granularity. So you decide whether name is a simple string or it's a bunch of parts or whether you're going to get super fancy and differentiate the parts of a hyphenated name and know which part came from uh, which family and all of that kind of stuff. Forms are not only useful though for data capture, they're also useful for display. Um, you will find in pretty much every clinic and hospital in the world uh, that they have standardized forms for uh, prenatal and postnatal care, for example, which is, this is one of. And the benefit of a form there is that a clinician who knows the form can take a patient that they've never seen before, grab their chart, go to this page, and know exactly what's going on with that patient's pregnancy, or at least 95% of the key information of what's going on with that patient's pregnancy, and, and do that really quickly. And that's much more useful in a real-life clinical situation than paging through page after page of page. Uh, in the chart with information coming from all sorts of different data sources gathered in different ways. So gathering and representing the information in a consistent way uh, really optimizes and reduces the cognitive burden on uh, the users who are trying to understand what's going on. Uh, and so forms are also relevant in that context. So forms are awesome. Why do we need anything else in FHIR? And the answer is that uh, while FHIR is really quite helpful, uh, questionnaire is really quite helpful for gathering information, it's not super helpful for analyzing information and retrieving information. You cannot search through uh, just against the questionnaire resource and say, find me all my diabetic patients, uh, or find me all of the patients that have an allergy to amoxicillin because that could be represented 1,500 different ways in the questionnaire responses. And you don't know what the questions are or how they were phrased or even how they're nested inside each other. I could have a question that says phone number, but without knowing the context where within uh, the questionnaire that falls, I don't know if that is a phone number for the patient, a phone number for their GP, a phone number for their insurance provider, a phone number for their uh, power of attorney contact, it could be all kinds of things. And so where in the questionnaire response a particular piece of information lives, uh, its meaning is influenced by everything else around it. And that makes query really hard. Uh, and of course, forms change over time. Uh, that uh, perinatal form is from a single organization. Every clinic has a different one. The ones that they were using five years ago probably look different than the ones that they're using now. And so it's very difficult uh, to compare information uh, across time and across organizations. And so we can't use a uh, questionnaire that way. And allergy intolerance, observation, medication statement are much more useful. I can hit observation and I can very easily retrieve all of your blood pressures for the last uh, 20 years. I might have to search against a few different link codes, um, but and possible the values will be a little bit different. Sometimes they, somebody might have captured it as a string because that's what their database did at the time. But in general, I'll be able to use that information in a much more consistent way, uh, regardless of where it came from. And so, what we will often do in the clinical space is where we need to have control over data capture or where we're using simple capture tools, gathering information directly from a patient or uh, using an app or something like that, 
we will use questionnaire and questionnaire response for that. Ideally, we will use a smart questionnaire that knows what the questions mean and can actually go look in uh, Fire Data repositories for some of the answers so that when you're filling out the form, it already knows what your first and last name is, it knows what your gender is, it knows what your date of birth is, maybe it knows some other things like your most recent height and weight. And so rather than having to type that information again for the fifth time today and the 200th time this year, that some of that information is already filled in and you can just look at it and go, yeah, that's the wrong phone number and fix it, but not have to type everything else in. And then after the user has reviewed the information that was pre-populated and answered all the questions that couldn't be pre-populated and said, okay, this is now done, you take that completed questionnaire response and move that data over into its other resources. So move the allergy stuff into allergy intolerance, move the medication stuff into medication statement, move a lot of things over into observation, because observation contains so much um, a lot of data actually from questionnaires will end up in observation. Uh, and that then makes that information available um, for statistical purposes, for easy retrieval, uh, for uh, manipulation over a smart on fire, and use in uh, clinical decision support, et cetera. And uh, if you want to be good practice about it, uh, you can link the questionnaire response to its observations or medication statements or family member history or wherever else uh, that data went and say, hey, there's traceability here. These elements in the allergy intolerance came from this questionnaire response or maybe even these specific questions or answers in the questionnaire response. So you have uh, that traceability using provenance resource. The reality is that a lot of systems are horrid uh, at tracking provenance right now. Um, FIRE provides the mechanism. It can't actually make systems use it and be good at it. Um, but as we start sharing information more and more, having that ability to know where data came from is really helpful in helping to decide, do I trust it, A, uh, and B, um, reconciling. So if you are getting allergies from 15 different systems to understand, oh, these actually all came from the same source, and so this one is closer to that original source, and so that's the one that I'll leverage. Um, without provenance, you just have 15 different assertions about allergic to amoxicillin, allergic to penicillin, intolerant to amoxicillin, the allergy is severe, or it's moderate, or I don't know. And then you're trying to figure out, is this okay? Are they allergic to the dye? Are they allergic to the actual drug? If I give them this other thing, is it gonna be a problem? It's hard to tell. Uh, and so provenance helps you to make that determination of where does, what do I rely on and what's current. And then in terms of what you passed around, sometimes you'll just pass around the observation and the allergy intolerance, uh, the sort of robust fireized data. Sometimes you will pass around the questionnaire response as well. Um, if the recipient needs to see the original source of truth, uh, then that can be conveyed. In terms of what questionnaire looks like, it's a really simple data model. So we've got a bunch of metadata, things like what is the title of the questionnaire and who created it? And what version is this? And uh, has it been endorsed by anybody? And what's the description of it so that I can search and go find questionnaires? And there's other uh, coded metadata so you can find questionnaires that are related to Alberta versus BC or questionnaires that are related to admissions versus uh, prior authorization versus oncology versus whatever. So there's a bunch of, like, a lot of uh, metadata that helps you to find the instrument uh, uh, in question. And then there's a simpler structure uh, called item that is a recursive structure that represents the questions in the questionnaire or sometimes just a grouping of questions in the questionnaire. And it can also represent display text. So the little disclaimer at the top that says, this information will be held for uh, six months and then disposed of, or this questionnaire is copyright by so-and-so, or 
uh, please fill out this form in a black pen, although we probably don't want to do that if we're rendering the form electronically. Uh, it might lead to improper behavior. Um, black pen is hard to get off of the screen, but that's the kind of text that can go into uh, a display item. And it's hierarchical, so you can have groups that contain groups that contain questions. And you can even have questions that contain questions. If you have a question that says other, please specify, then the please specify line is actually a child question. Um, and that allows you to represent very simple forms where you've got a flat list of five questions and nothing else. And it lets you represent very complex questions where you have a section for uh, family history, and then you have the section for each family member, and then you have a section for the conditions of that family member, and then you have a con section for the assessment of those conditions. You can nest as deeply as you want to, or at least as deeply as your user, user interface happens to allow. So the types of items are groups, uh, and groups are organizational. They don't actually gather data themselves. They contain other things. Uh, and every group has to have at least one child. Uh, typically child questions can also be child display items and you're never gonna have an answer for a group. So if you have a group that says uh, family history, you're not actually gathering text there. You're, there's gonna be child questions where you're, or child sections groups uh, where you're gonna get the information. Questions are designed to have answers. So they will have a data type like integer or string or date or time, or in the fire world, they can have a data type of reference, which is a fire pointer to a resource. So you can have a question that says, uh, what is your local pharmacy? And actually have a user interface element that lets the user select from pharmacies within a geographic range and have a pointer to an organization um, rather than typing in the name of it and the phone number of it and the address of it if you even have a clue what those things are. Uh, and it also means that if you've got a reference that when the phone number changes, I, that information can automatically be uh, updated because it's a pointer. It's not you're filling in the, the uh, phone number by hand. Uh, Questions aren't necessarily always mandatory. So there is metadata on item that allows you to say, you have to fill this one in or it's okay to skip this one. Um, sometimes it's, it's fine for people to skip things over. Uh, if you say, which of these conditions do you have? Sometimes they don't have any of them and you don't wanna make that mandatory um, or some questions only apply to certain types of patients. And then display text is any kind of helper hint text uh, guidance, something where you're not asking for information and it's not really organizing anything, it's just stuff to display uh, to whoever is filling it out. So what does that mean in practice? Um, past supper for most of you, hopefully you've all eaten, otherwise this is kind of cruel, um, but here's a not terribly healthcare related uh, question, uh, but it's going to show you where in the questionnaire model these different things live. So the first part is a prefix. You don't have to specify prefixes for your items in questionnaire. If you don't, it's sort of up to the rendering tool to decide whether to put numbers or letters or anything else in front of the items or nothing at all. Um, but particularly if you have instructions like display text that say, you must fill out at least one of questions two and 17, uh, then it's kind of helpful if question two and 17 are actually called two and 17 as opposed to, uh, B and I don't know what 17 is in the alphabet, but whatever that is. Um, and so you can define what, what you want those to be. Then we've got the text of the question uh, and that's just free text string. We have extensions where you can do fancier things. So if you wanted to have different colors or you wanted it to be italics or bold or something like that, then there are extensions where you can have that type of control, but typically it's just a plain string. Uh, then we have a child item. Uh, this is a display item. It's actually conveying to us a little bit of information about the metadata uh, that's on the parent item. 
So we have the ability to say for an item, is this required or not? We also have the ability to say, does this repeat or not? So can you have multiple answers or are you stuck with only one answer? And it would kind of stuck to be only able to choose one topping for your pizza, particularly if the choice includes cheese. Um, I have a son who'd be perfectly happy with that, but uh, for most of us, we'd like other things too. Um, and so in this case, uh, required equals true and repeats equals true. Then we have our list of options. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do that in a questionnaire. Uh, you can either just enumerate the set of codes or dates or whatever it is in line with the question. Or you can point to another resource uh, that exists in Fire called Value Set, uh, which is reusable. Um, and so it allows you to define the allowed set of codes elsewhere. And if you have a complex set of codes that you want to maintain independently, like what is the current list of drugs that are available for prescribing in BC, that's not a list that you probably want to include in your questionnaire. Um, being able to point externally to that is helpful. But even if it's a short list, uh, sometimes it's helpful to include it as a value set because you're gonna use that same short list multiple times. I'm sure many of you are familiar with forms where they ask you 25 questions and the answers to all of them are strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. And it's kind of nice to not have to repeat those five options on every single question as you're creating your questionnaire. So you can define a value set, put the five um, code choices in that, and then just point to the value set from every item in your questionnaire. And if somebody decides, you know what, the term strongly agree is not what we want to go with, we want to say very much agree, then it's change in one place as opposed to a change everywhere. And down here, we have a nested question. Uh, and it's a nested question that actually has uh, a little bit of logic to it, because we don't say, please specify if you choose cheese or ham or mushrooms. I guess you could theoretically choose what kind of mushrooms you wanted, but that would be a different kind of question. Uh, in this case, uh, we only want it to appear inside of the other item. And so we have uh, a, what's called an enable when clause on the child question that says only turn this on uh, if the answer happens to be, in this case, other. Uh, and then we have a prompt that says, here's what we want to display. And this, the top level question probably has a data type of code or in R4 it would be choice. Uh, the nested question would have a data type of string. So you're free to type whatever the heck you want. But that's essentially what the data model uh, for questionnaire does is you've got this collection of items and you have the ability to specify uh, what is it uh, that you want to fill in. So looking at uh, the full resource, um, you can see sort of what I was talking about. We've got all of this metadata. That's what is really on this left-hand side is all metadata. So what is the uh, title of this questionnaire, other identifiers that it happens to be known by, this questionnaire was derived from somewhere else, here's when it was published, here's who published it, here's you, how you can phone or email or the website of whoever published it, uh, copyright information, so are you allowed to use this questionnaire for certain purposes, effective period, when is this questionnaire deemed to be valid or not, you, sometimes you'll have a link code that corresponds to a questionnaire and so you can fill all of that in. And essentially you use this to search for the form or once you've got a list of forms to figure out, yes, this is the one that I need uh, to fill out or that I want the patient to fill out or whatever. Item, uh, we have this little link ID thing which we're gonna talk about in a minute. This is how we tie uh, the, the question definition uh, into its answers. Uh, we've got some metadata that allows us to tie link codes or data element definitions. We've got our prefix, we've got our text, we've got what kind of question is this. Uh, we can identify whether it repeats or whatever. Enable when is that logic piece I talked about. We can have initial values, we can enumerate our options, we can also have a value set of options. And then we have this repeating structure. 
And so this one data model allows you to capture every single piece of healthcare data that you could possibly imagine, including a ton of stuff that has nothing to do with healthcare at all. Like, what do you want to eat for supper tonight? Uh, so it's a really, really flexible uh, resource in terms of what you can capture with it. So how do we tie questions to responses? And the answer is these little link ID things. So every question has to have a link ID. And in our question and response, we will also have that link ID. You'll notice as well here, uh, in addition to the link ID, we have text on both questionnaire and questionnaire response. We could have skipped that. We could have just said, well, you've got the link ID, go look up the text from the questionnaire. We chose to not do that because we'd like our resources to be somewhat standalone. We like uh, you to be able to receive a resource and be able to use it as is without necessarily having to grab a bunch of other stuff before you have a clue what it means. And uh, it'd sort of be the equivalent of having an observation uh, that, does, that has a value but doesn't have a code. You have to go and query somewhere else to figure out whether you're looking at uh, a systolic blood pressure or a diastolic blood pressure. And seeing the value 120 isn't super helpful uh, if you don't know which one of those two things it is. One of them you look at and go, yeah, that's fine. The other one you look at and go, that's pretty not good. And so you, you really need to have both. And so we duplicate the text or at least allow the duplication of the text in the questionnaire response. And so here we have a group, item type equals group, uh, called G1. And in the questionnaire response, you'll see that we have two items. Uh, we have a G1 here and we have a G1 here. In the questionnaire, G1 is globally unique. You'll never see a questionnaire that contains two link IDs with the same value, no matter where in the nesting they happen to show up. Uh, it's unique throughout the entire questionnaire. On the questionnaire response though, they can repeat because sometimes uh, the items that you're representing are repeating items. So here, uh, G1 shows up twice because we're gonna ask the same set of questions of two different uh, individuals. And then within that, we've got our link ID for our question. So what is your name? And we fill those things out and we've got all of these different questions. So that was an overview of the base fire part of questionnaire and questionnaire response. Any questions about what I've covered so far? Uh, we do have a question from oh. Catherine in the chat, Lloyd. I was not monitoring the chat. I should have done that. I will do that now. My Great. apologies for not paying attention. No worries. That's a, a good point to have. Oh. To have some Actually, questions. I'm not seeing the question in the chat. That's not good. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, it might have gone to you directly, Linda. Yes. So the question from Catherine. Um, Catherine, would you like to ask the question or would you like me to? Sure. Um, hey, Lloyd, it's Catherine. Hi. Is the end goal for fire questionnaires to be incorporated into like your tertiary care EMRs and your primary care physician EMRs? And then they... Um. The aim of FIRE is to get use wherever it's useful. Um, I mean, reality is the questionnaire, the, the concept of a form shows up everywhere. So primary EHRs, tertiary hospitals, physio clinics, uh, I mean, you fill out forms when you go to get a COVID vaccine, uh, you might fill out a form at your local pharmacy uh, they can show up anywhere. Uh, and so any place where it is useful to have a mode of, yeah, I got a really simple application um, that doesn't know really about all of this fire stuff, but it can handle a list of questions and answers. And if I change the list of questions, I can pass it an updated definition and it can ask the new set, um, then questionnaire is appropriate or where, 
you're doing research or something else where you really want to have that robust control. Um, so we see forms being used all over the place. Um, I've been involved in projects where they're being used in research. I've been involved in projects where they're being used uh, in the claims process. I mean, the, the real benefit of a FIRE questionnaire is the ability to share the definition. So if you are working with an application where it doesn't need to share the definition, a lot of EHRs have an ability to just define forms inside them. Uh, and there's no need for that to necessarily be standardized and passed around, uh, then you might not bother using FIRE at all. But if you are have a central forms repository uh, like has been developed in DC, then having those questionnaires defined in FIRE and then available for retrieval um, by client systems, it'll just, in the, right now, just launch an app that knows how to dis to display them, got the user through the data capture and then store the lo data locally and or file it in a provincial system is attractive and useful. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So like where it's most useful, is it where it would be I guess, I guess the flip side of Katrin's question is, um, are any of the big EMR vendor systems implementing questionnaires, or is it really more the smaller systems that want flexibility um, and standardization? Um, so I can't say really what's going on in Canada because all of my clients are American right now, pretty much. Uh, but I know things like the Epics and the Cerners and all scripts or whatever they're calling themselves these days. Um, U.S. Core has, uh, the newest version of U.S. Core has support for questionnaire baked in. Um, it's not super complicated. Uh, we're going to talk in a little bit about what pieces of questionnaire they've chosen to bite off. But the notion of, yeah, we have forms that are come to us for social determinants of health or uh, coverage uh uh, prior authorization requirements or government forms or whatever that we need to be able to handle arbitrary stuff that somebody else defines and we got to fill it out uh, and store it so that we have uh, legal proof of what we said uh, when and if somebody decides to sue us that's absolutely something that uh, you need to deal with regardless of whether you're big or small. Um, the smaller implementers tend to to be a bit slower to do the fire thing because it's new and who's going to pay for it. Uh, whereas the EHRs, the, the bigger organizations that sort of, yeah, regulation in various countries say that we have to and it's useful. So let's do it that way. Cool, thank you. Um, and we have a question from Florin. Did you want to ask that yourself? Is it that one's in the chat you should be able to see? Actually, no, it wasn't a question. I was answering, I was providing a bit more context to Catherine's question. So I know doctors of BC were working on a FIRE questionnaire repository. They were working also with Ontario MD. Uh, AWS and UBC are working on another small proof of concept. So people are working at exploring, but nothing formal as far as I know. No adoption in EMRs. Okay. Yeah, I, I know one of the um, provincial health authorities in BC uh, also had an initiative around uh, using questionnaire and questionnaire response. And there, rather than expecting the EMRs to have questionnaire and questionnaire response locally, they were just saying, you smart. So uh, totally fine that you don't know what a questionnaire or a questionnaire response is, just let people launch a smart app and then they can go and grab the relevant form and fill it out and send us the data. And if you want to store it, cool. Um, but it's all of the work is actually done by a third party system. So that's another way of managing that complexity. And in fact, in terms of what US Core has done, they've sort of handled very simple forms in a standardized way with an epic Cerner, et cetera. But anything complicated, they do say, yeah, use a smart app. 
um, or there's another technology called adaptive forms that we'll talk about in a few minutes um, that's also possible. And so that's the direction that they've gone. We do the simple stuff and anything else, we'll use an app to handle complicated things. That way it's not our problem. Thanks, Lloyd. Any other questions before Lloyd keeps going? Uh, yes, so this is Shali here. I have a question. I, rather, mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm confused a bit or rather please clear it off me, for me. In your previous example that you gave, um, there were choices um, for the topics, right? Yep. And then comes uh, please specify. Yep. So when we give such an option of please specify, uh, there can be a free text. So going yep. back to your, um, you know, first few slides where you mentioned how a clinician uh, have would have difficulty to extract or even visualize um, a various text, free text written about blood pressure, uh, the analysis of that data uh, or extraction of that data. Uh, how would it just say? Oh, sorry, how would um, Fire would help with this free text? Uh, you know, where it is, please specify and somebody writing anything over there as a topping. Sure. So let's say we wanted to extract this into FHIR. Uh, and there is actually a nutrition order uh, resource in FHIR. It's typically not for pizza, um, but we could probably figure out a way to make it fit. Uh, mm -hmm. And in that resource, there's an ability to capture ingredients. And ingredients are captured using codable concepts. Uh, and the codable concept data type consists of both codings and text. And so what we would do is we would put in a coding for cheese, a coding for ham, a coding for mushrooms, or whichever ones were selected. And then where they've done other, please specify, we could have the coding for other if we wanted to, not super useful, but we probably would, because why not? Um, but we would also fill in the text element, which is the original text with the user typed or saw. And so if they want to type green preppers or uh, anchovies or whatever imaginative thing that they come up with, then they can do that. Obviously, what's captured as text uh, is less computable. And so if you're doing automated checking for food allergies, if you're doing automated checking for do we have these ingredients, um, automated checking for, uh, yeah, we don't do caviar because that's too expensive. Uh, the ability to do that with free text is going to be limited. And so you design your questionnaires based on what is the reality of what users are going to need to be able to say or want to be able to say, as well as how your system is going to need to deal with it on the back end. So in a regular pizza shop, they can type, the user can type whatever they want. And if they specify something that we don't carry, then we'll just uh, refuse their order. Um, you could go that route, or you could say, no, we're gonna enumerate, these are the 20 different ingredients that we have, pick one of them, we don't let you choose another, that's not something that we support. Questionnaire is perfectly happy either way. Uh, you design the questionnaire based on what it is that you want people to capture. And if you constrain them, then there's a limit on what they can say. And if there's things that they want to say that the form doesn't let them, then they may struggle or they may not fill out the form or they may skip the question or they may make something up. Um, and uh, if you give them that flexibility to gather extra data that is less computable, um, I mean, you can throw AI or um, text recognition uh, encoding software to try to understand what they wrote, and maybe have some success with that, um, but it's all trade-offs. So uh, it's really a question of how you want to use the data and what you expect the user to want to be able to say. Did that answer your question, Shelley? Sure, thank you so much. Because um, uh, I, I think in one of the projects that I was working before, um, uh, I heard a lot of vendors wanted to use OCR for the free text. And uh, I, I don't know, the project was not much successful. I mean, we should have been, we would have been using OCR long back if it would have been successful. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of legacy data 
that is free text and OCR is your best chance of getting something out of it. I mean, chat GPT and other AI stuff might be even better than OCR used to be. Um, I mean, that, that technology continues to get better and it continues to get smarter. But if you want guaranteed computability and reliable computability, then that comes by restraining and constraining uh, what the user can say. But when you, so for example, if I'm writing a discharge summary, as a clinician, I'm probably going to be a little bit antsy and unhappy if the only thing I'm allowed to do is choose from multiple choice answers and I can't do anything else because I want to tell a story. I have priorities that I want to convey first and I want to convey nuance in those things because I'm talking to another clinician who's going to be looking at this either tomorrow or five years from now and I want them to understand and multiple choice is often not well suited for that um, and computability of the discharge summary is probably not my top priority. On the other hand, uh, for uh, certain types of pathology, they have super robust um, deeply nested, tightly constrained uh, forms that very much and gather things in a rigorous fashion. They do have outlets in various places where you can add additional notes and pretext narrative to convey nuance that uh, the computable representation doesn't give you. Um, but both both approaches are possible. And which approach is most appropriate is, is going to be driven by a bunch of things. Um, sometimes it's what is the value to the person who's capturing the data. Really tight data entry control almost always takes longer to fill out than just typing what you want. Um, and so there's a cost to it. And imposing that cost on somebody who doesn't get benefit from it is hard. Uh, it's a hard sell. Um, and often the benefit of computability is multiple stages downstream. It helps with research, it helps with public health, it helps with all sorts of things that do not give me a paycheck right now and do not justify the fact that I can now only see 10 patients in an hour as opposed to the 12 that I used to be able to see. So nope, disable that module, I don't want it. That's the kind of decision that, ha that drives how data gets captured. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Anybody else? All right, let's jump into structured data capture. Uh, hopefully, uh, as part of the exposure to fire that you've had, you've heard of the 80% rule. And the 80% rule is what helps to drive the design of our fire resources. The gist of it is we don't put every single possible data element into our resources. We have had experience doing that in other standards and the results are not pretty. Uh, you end up with like 200 elements on patient demographics and everybody who looks at the standard goes, uh, which of these should I actually use? And they end up picking different subsets and it's overwhelming and scary, and we don't get the kind of interoperability we would like to have. So in FHIR, the core resources only include those elements that we think that most systems out there in the world that support patient demographics or family history, or in this case, questionnaire, most of the systems that will use questionnaire will actually support. And the problem with questionnaire is there's a wide range of capabilities out there. There are a lot of really simple form systems that don't have much sophistication. And when we're calculating 80%, they're gonna make up a significant portion of that numerator. And so we can't put in a whole bunch of fancy stuff into the base questionnaire resource as a lot of systems don't support fancy things. But we still want to standardize the fancy things. So that if you want pictures in your questionnaire or you want bold or italics or purple, or you want to be able to say, when you are looking up uh, the patient's current pharmacy, 
here's the server that you're going to do that on, and here's how you figure out that an organization is a pharmacy as opposed to a medic clinic as opposed to a veterinary clinic or whatever else might be available. And here's how you figure out ones that are reasonable to go after so that you're getting one that's in their local community as opposed to someone that's sitting in the UK or something. And so we want to be able to do those things and do them consistently, um, but we can't do it in the core resource. And so in FHIR, when there's something that we want to standardize that is not well-defined or shouldn't be well-defined in the base resource, we create an implementation guide. And structured data capture is one of the very first implementation guides to be created in the FHIR space. US Core, I think, was the first one, um, but SDC was number three-ish. And it covers a bunch of things. It covers workflow. So what are the systems that are involved in the questionnaire space? What do they do? Um, how do I display forms with tables and pretty colors and pictures and all that kind of stuff? Form behavior, how do I calculate scores? How do I turn things on and off? Um, how do I route information? How do I cause stuff to automatically get filled in or grab data from an existing form and fill it in somewhere else? How do I have a form that uh, has its rules defined uh, elsewhere and aren't necessarily visible uh, to the system that's filling them out. And so SDC is the implementation guide that basically says, whatever fancy, wild, and crazy stuff you want to do, we will do our best to standardize it here. So let's drill into each of those in a little bit more detail. In terms of workflow, we define the different types of systems. We introduce form terms like a form filler a system where a user will interact with and complete an existing form. And we will say, what does that need to be able to do? Well, it needs to be able to grab a questionnaire uh, from another system. It needs to be able to store uh, a completed or partially completed questionnaire response. It might need to be able to retrieve value sets so that uh, it can display the appropriate list of codes. Um, it might need, need to be able to do operations that will populate the form or extract information from the form. We have a form manager, which is a repository of forms that you can call and search and say, find me uh, a admission form for this region for a pediatric patient, and it will go and find the one that's active as of this year. Maybe there's a couple of them available and you have to choose which of them is the appropriate one for you to use based on the metadata that's available. There's form receivers, which are sort of black boxes of when you are finished completing the reform, you will send it here. And I will say, thanks, got it. And you will never see it again. And magic will happen on the back end that will cause UPS to ship you something or will cause information to be recorded into a public health database or will cause somebody to give you a phone call in three weeks when they finally bother to look at the data and ask you some questions or whatever it is. There's a whole bunch of processes where it's send a form somewhere and then magic happens. And so we have defined an application role um, or capability statement for that type of system. We've also defined behavior for, I would like this patient to fill out a form. How do I ask them to do that? How do I track whether they have in fact done it or whether they said, nah, I don't feel like it and manage that. So SDC gives us mechanisms for doing all of those different kinds of things. Uh, we also have the ability to derive forms. So I might create uh, 20 different forms that all have the same demographic section. It's kind of nice if I don't have to uh, decide, you know what, I it's now important to start asking about uh, social social gender or uh, pronoun preferences. We, we do that now in, in BC or in our organization or wherever that is. So I'm, I need to add some questions for that. I don't want to have to go and update 20 different forms. I'd like to just update one. And so we have an ability to create forms that reuse either chunks of questions or even individual questions. There are organizations that have libraries of 20,000 plus standard questions uh, and they like to reuse them because 
there are a whole bunch of different forms that ask those questions for different reasons, but if the questions are consistent, if the way that the answers are phrased are consistent, then that information gathered in different contexts is still more comparable. And you can also apply best practices in terms of how should this question be phrased? What are the best way to display the answers? Or even how do we consistently extract this information and how do we allow for variances in how data gets represented in different EPIC systems or Cerner systems that we can extract most efficiently. And so reuse is useful and we define mechanisms for that. In terms of form rendering, I uh, introduce color, introduce pictures, uh, be able to hide questions. Sometimes you'll automatically populate information, things like what is the resource ID that I'm grabbing this observation from? User doesn't wanna see that. In fact, if you showed it to them, they'd get scared because the ID might be a UUID. So a bunch of uh, hex uh, digits, which most patients and most clinicians really don't want to see on the screen. Um, maybe you want a table uh, and you want to say what goes in each of the columns and how wide are the columns. Maybe you want to say, I want this to be radio buttons or I want it to be a drop down. I want this to be a slider and I want the starting value to be this and the ending value to be this and the uh, spacing of the, uh, the steppers to be five or 10 or whatever, or I'm gonna capture a phone number. And in the background, I wanna show NNN-NNN-NNN because that's how we do phone numbers in Canada. And I like them in a consistent format, thanks, because otherwise my database is unhappy. And you can design all of that. From a behavior perspective, you can turn things on or off. So uh, if uh, the total score for questions one through five is greater than 30, then I got more questions. If it was below 30, then we don't need to bother with that extra stuff. Or I'm only going to ask for last menstrual cycle if uh, question two was answered in one of these three ways. Or I need to have at least two of these five questions answered uh, in order for my form to be considered complete. We might constrain the values. So how long is the string allowed to be? You can't answer uh, with just two characters and I really don't want you to answer with 50 million characters. So what, what is reasonable? Or I might wanna set boundaries around dates or times or numbers. If I'm going to attach stuff, maybe I wanna attach an image. Do I accept uh, GIF? or do I only accept JPEGs? Am I willing to accept a two terabyte image or do I want it to be slightly more manageable than that? If I'm capturing quantities, maybe I wanna constrain the units of measure or I've got, I'm ordering pizza and you can choose up to two toppings for this particular type of pizza. You can't choose more than that. So I can set minimums and maximums in terms of repetitions. We talked about this earlier where you've got references and you wanna be able to say, what kind of thing are you pointing to? Are you pointing to practitioners or locations or observations? Where are you gonna grab that data from? How are you going to filter it? Or even, I can't find my clinician in this list. Let me create a new one and give me a new questionnaire that will let me fill that out and automatically extract the information and produce a new practitioner in the system that I can then point to. I don't know how realistic that is for most registries. Um, maybe it makes more sense for an allergy or a condition or something like that, but that's something you can do in STC. You can also do calculations, um, automatically fill out uh, information. All of that is uh, form behavior. In terms of pre-population, uh, this is where we start to talk about the notion of mapping a little bit, at least insofar as questionnaires occur. Uh, it's really useful to be able to automatically fill data into a form um, uh, when you're presenting it to a user. Uh, a, it makes the user happy because they have to type less. And whether you're dealing with a clinician or you're dealing with a patient, they're all happy to type less. Uh, it also means that the data is likely to be more accurate because you're not going to have transcription and typing errors. Uh, you might gather data that the user forgets even exists. 
uh, and propagate it across. And if we propagate data that's wrong, then there's a better chance of you actually getting it corrected. Um, but in order for population to work, you need to have a data source. Now, the original version of SCC actually used a data source of CDA, uh, except it turns out that nobody really wanted to do that because CDA kind of sucked as a source for automated extraction. Uh, and so uh, more recent versions of STC now draw data from uh, fire data stores. But you need to have a server that you can actually go and query and grab the data out of. Uh, then you need to have some sort of mapping uh, inside uh, the questionnaire that says, hey, this thing is a patient name, this thing is a body weight, this thing is a blood type. Uh, and then you need some sort of engine that can look at that metadata, go look at the data source and grab the relevant information uh, in order to fill stuff out. We defined three different mechanisms um, in FHIR for doing that uh, population process. Uh, and we defined three ways, not because we like things to be complicated, uh, but because there were three different patterns with different levels of complexity and uh, where there was enough commonality, uh, where there was value in doing things the simple way, as well as value in doing things the compl complicated way and, and also having a middle of the road. So those are observation-based and fire path or expression-based and structure map-based. The notion with observation based uh, is that a whole lot of questions and questionnaires really come down to being observations. What was your, what's your height? What's your weight? What's your blood type? When was your last menstrual cycle? All of those kinds of things are manifest in fire as observations. Um, how many calories did you eat today? Um, how many steps did you do? Uh, what is your mood? Observation, point in time, value. And uh, if you remember back when we looked at all of the data elements on item, one of the elements that appears on item is a code where you can throw a link code or a SNOMED code or a Dr. Bob's most favorite excellent observation codes, any codes that seem like, uh, and you can put those inside your questionnaire on the items uh, as metadata that says, this is what this question means. And so that's a really easy thing for people to do, uh, is as you're writing the questionnaire, say, yeah, this corresponds to this code, this corresponds to this code. Not a whole lot of programming skill required to do that. And lots of people who create questionnaires are perfectly comfortable with something like that. And then if we've got that, then really the only other piece of information we need to automatically grab stuff is how old is, can the, or how recent does the data need to be uh, for it to be useful? So something like blood type, I can go and grab the blood type for the patient from 20 years ago, and it's probably still perfectly valid. Blood types don't change much. Learned that they can. Uh, certain types of transplants can actually change your blood type. Uh, but for most patients, what you had when you uh, had your blood tested when you were a newborn, still true for you now. On the other hand, uh, when you're grabbing patient's weight, grabbing the weight from when you were a newborn, probably not so useful. Uh, so might want that to not be older than a month or maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, height, probably a year ago is fine if you're an adult, might depend on the, on the age of the patient, how far back that's reasonable to go. Uh, something like, how are you feeling? How happy are you today? you're probably not going to populate that at all because you want a new fresh value filled in right now for the form. That's not a populatable thing. That's, I always need new data. So depending on how old uh, you want it to be, uh, we can put that metadata into the questionnaire and that's all that you need, code and a date. So what does that mean in practice? This is an example of a questionnaire and it's got, a special extension on it. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about extensions in FHIR, it's the ability to add extra stuff. And we do tons of that in the STC implementation guide. And here we say that we're, when we're going and grabbing observations, we're interested in anything for this. 
that is valid as of the last three months. So if it's three months ago or newer, then we'll take it. And we've got actually three different codes on this particular question, because there's a whole bunch of different ways of saying body weight in LOINC. So we've got three different codes that we're perfectly happy with. We've got the text of the question that says the type is quantity. Um, and then we're, we said that we're happy to receive this in either kilograms uh, or uh, US pounds. Apparently there's multiple different types of pounds, the joys of units of measure. What that will translate into in the population logic is it will go hit the server wherever it's going to grab data and we'll search where the subject equals whoever is the subject of this current questionnaire response, where the code is one of those link codes that we specified on the question, where the status is completed. We don't want preliminary weights. We don't want entered and error weights. We want the ones that are, yeah, this is, this is solved, this is current. And it looks at what is the date today? And then goes back three months and says, anything that is greater than or equal to that date, give it to me. And then we do a little bit of magic where we say sort by descending date. So I want the most recent first, and I only want one. So I don't need to see all 50 weights that you've got in the system, only give me the most recent. And if we get anything back for that, that is the answer that we will populate into that question. If we don't get anything back for that, then we don't pre-populate the answer and the user has to fill it in. Or if it's an optional question, maybe they don't fill it in, but that's how it works. So that's a very simple mapping approach uh, where we're just doing observation based on code and we're always grabbing the observation value. Sometimes we want more complicated things than that. Maybe you want the patient's name or gender or date of birth, or maybe we're going after observation, but we don't want the value. We want the low normal range or we want the interpretation of was this uh, high or critically high or something like that. And so the observation-based approach where we're always grabbing value isn't sufficient. And here, uh, we take advantage of some other extensions, like the ability to, when we are starting a form filler and saying, hey, I would like you to fill out a form now, we can go and grab um, information like who is the current patient, who is the current author, what is the current encounter? And pass some of that information in. And then we can embed metadata inside uh, the questionnaire and say, this thing corresponds to patient.name.given. And this thing corresponds to patient.name.family. Uh, or this corresponds to patient.date. And embed those simple paths. Uh, there's a language that we use a lot all over the fire specification called fire path kind of similar to x path um, but the key thing is that it is not specific to syntax so we don't care whether the data is xml or json or rdf um, the path works the same and the passing language has some smarts around vocabulary and other kinds of things and so we can embed this metadata inside the questionnaire to say these are the mappings uh, for each of these different data elements. There's another mechanism, actually, uh, I just jumped uh, to extraction, but same principles apply. There's a third mechanism, which is our, uh, uses a technology called structure map. And actually, let's go jump and look at that. Um, Structure map, um, some of you might have heard of XSLT, which is a transform language. Structure map is kind of like that, but it is also syntax agnostic. And what it lets you do is create groups of mapping statements and you define what your source is, define what the rule is, and the rule can do various types of uh, transformation so you can extract substrings, you can concatenate things together, you can do mathematics on dates and other stuff. I, you can move things all over the place. So it lets you do much more sophisticated uh, extraction processes or population processes than just 
here's the path to the thing that I want. Uh, I can route data through a concept map. Uh, concept map allows you to take a value set, say uh, ICD-10 codes and a different value set of SNOMED codes and say, this code corresponds to this code. This code corresponds to one of these three codes and you'll figure out which one is based on this other data element that conveys severity. And you can go through and say, and this map one doesn't map at all. This one maps, but it doesn't quite mean the same thing because the source is broader than the target or vice versa. And you can capture all of that information. So where we used to do mappings in Excel and still often do mappings in Excel, Concept Map lets us do that same kind of thing, but with more precision and lets us share. I can post a structure map onto a server and anybody in the country can come along and grab it and say, hey, here's an awesome mapping between SNOMED and ICD-10. I don't have to maintain my own anymore. Awesome. And furthermore, when somebody fixes the mapping, I can have a subscription to that and I can receive a notification. Hey, there's a new version. So I can go grab the new version and drive my code off of that new version. So it allows much more reusability uh, and shareability of these maps. And structure map works the same way. I can post a structure map that says, hey, here's a structure map that will convert between this V2 message and CDA, if you wanted to do that, or this uh, um, CDA structure and fire, or this fire structure of questionnaire response and this other fire structure, which is a bundle of observations and conditions and other cool stuff. And so we use this mechanism when it's not as straightforward of grab this element from here, grab this element from here, grab this element from there, done. Uh, but instead we need to generate stuff. So maybe I need to generate some GUIs and I need to put the GUID in multiple places because I got a bundle that's referencing things all over the place. And I'm going to, do some date calculations and other kinds of stuff. The structure map gives us that capability. Um, there's actually a text-based language uh, where you can write this stuff like code. Um, and there's a formal uh, language definition. We're starting to get some tools showing up uh, that know how to write this stuff. Um, and even some nice GUI drag and drop. Um, functionality, um, but this is sort of what uh, a simple version of, of a map looks like. So I'm starting with this data structure. My target is this data structure. I've just got a single group in this one where I'm mapping uh, from A to B, and I'm going to fill in uh, certain elements um, uh, with other values. So here I'm actually just setting fixed values. So uh, my status is always draft, my category is always non-stock, my priority is always routine, and then I'm populating other information. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on, I, Gravity Social Determinants of Health, uh, is using structure maps to take a questionnaire response and generate observations and also generate condition resources for that questionnaire. And so there's a whole bunch of things that they need to fill out uh, they create derivation relationships so that the observation points back to the questionnaire response. They generate IDs for the observation. They have the condition so that it points back to the observations and also to the questionnaire response. Really cool stuff that just happens automatically, but you have to write this. You're not going to give your average data analyst who knows how to fill out a simple little form and can type five questions and say, this one's an integer and this one's a date, and maybe fill out a link code, they're not gonna write this stuff. This requires somebody who, A, understands the two data structures that they're mapping, understands fire path, but also really understands how to program because that's kind of what you're doing here. Uh, so really, really powerful, but a smaller portion of the community that's gonna be able to manage writing this kind of stuff. And uh, we can do these same mechanisms for populating questionnaires and also for extracting information uh, from questionnaire responses. In terms of tooling, there's lots of tools out there. Um, I, actually, if you go to the Structured Data Capture Implementation Guide, uh, we will point you to Confluence page where there's a ton of commercial and open source tools. There's 
more that tend to show up um, every Connectathon. Um, so there are tools to help you create these questionnaires. Uh, National Library of Medicine, if you want a questionnaire that is based on link, uh, it'll do it autom automatically for you. You type in the link code and say, I want a questionnaire, and boom, it generates one for you and even does a whole bunch of population stuff for you. Uh, so that's kind of sweet. Um, but there are tools that will automatically uh, sort of render forms and let you enter them in, all that kind of stuff. I had promised I was going to talk about adaptive forms. Adaptive forms are the other technique that US Corps uses when they have complicated forms that the EHRs don't want to have to manage. And what happens in an adaptive form is that all of the logic lives in a black box. And that black box exposes a simple op uh, operation that says, what's the next question? And so I start with a blank questionnaire response and a contained questionnaire that's empty. And I say, what's the next question? And it comes back with my questionnaire response with the contained questionnaire containing the first question. And I answer it. And then I send it off again and it comes back and now I've got two questions. And I answer the second one, I send it off and it comes back and now it's got three questions. And I answer it and I keep doing that until it says, yeah, you're done. I don't have any more questions for you. And that's really useful uh, when you've got uh, forms that have IP constraints where they don't want to tell you their secret sauce and what their business logic is, or maybe their business logic is AI. And you've got some AI system that's figuring out what the next question is. There are payers who are doing that because, hey, AI is cool and all that. Um, and there's no mechanism right now, uh, I mean, with extensions, I guess you could do anything, but it'd be kind of crazy to try to embed AI logic into the questionnaire definition. You really want to wrap that stuff in a black box. Um, or in the case of payers, it might not be AI, it might be COBOL code that's been running since the beginning of time. Um, in any case, they have their logic and you're simply wrapping an interface over top of that logic and interacting with it. So process is what's your name, provide an answer, next question, provide an answer, next question, provide an answer. And in case that you thought that there's never any fun um, in the healthcare standards world, there are actually standard LOINC questions uh, for each of, or standard LOINC codes for each of those questions. So there, there is a little bit of geekiness and fun in uh, the standard space. So that was all I wanted to say and probably all I have time to say about questionnaire. Um, I promised to talk a little bit about simplifier, so I'm gonna do that and then we've got a wee bit more time for, squeeze in a little bit more time for questions. So simplifier uh, is a bunch of things. Uh, let's actually go there. Simplifier is a registry. Uh, so I can search for uh, social determinants and it will come back and say, hey, there's a bunch of stuff in terms of implementation guides and value sets and code systems and things that are related to um, that particular topic. So it's an ability to find what's out there and reuse it. And Simplifier contains everything that HL7 International has ever published, plus everything that's ever been created by people who use Simplifier tools, which is a lot of folks. There's a bunch of Canadian implementation guides that leverage Simplifier. Tons and tons of stuff in Europe also leverages Simplifier. Um, so it's probably the biggest, uh, broadest registry that exists of Fire stuff. So that you can find and see and reuse or at least align. And that's useful. Um, it also uh, is a set of tools that lets you go and create your own. Uh, so Canada, InfoA has a bunch of simplifier licenses uh, that they give to projects to support uh, creation of pan-Canadian stuff or, or various other Canadian projects. Uh, but uh, you can author your content either through simplifier website directly or there's another tool uh, that they use for creating profiles called Forge, where you sort of create your 
profile on your desktop and then you upload that into the Simplifier environment, but they will publish uh, your implementation guide. They're not rendering this one actually, because this one, let me see if I can find one that it will render properly, hopefully. Yeah, uh, so it will actually expose um, the content and you, then you can go in and look at that content and see uh, and it's got a fairly nice user interface uh, as you select an element you can see what it is you can also open things up and go inside see all of the slicing and see all of the rules um, so it is um, not a tool that I actually use because uh, I can do things more efficiently with other tools because I do this all the time. Uh, and I don't like my hand being held. I like to do power user stuff. But for people who are new uh, to Fire, having your hand held is a really useful thing because there's all sorts of uh, rules and ways you can get yourself into trouble. And tools like uh, Simplifier and, and the Firely tool suite in general uh, help prevent you from getting into those spaces. Um, they also mean that you can't necessarily do the super cool newest things that uh, Fire is defined, and so there's that trade-off. Um, but for most of you who are just new into the Fire space, uh, Simplifier is probably a really good entry point, both for discovery, seeing what else is out there, uh, as well as for starting to play around. Uh, Simplifier is a commercial tool. Uh, I think you can go in for free and you can create one implementation guide, maybe two, I forget what the limit is, uh, on your own that you can't really share and have multiple people work on, but you can play around yourself. Um, but if you want to uh, do commercial work or you want to bring in multiple people into a project, then there's annual licensing fees and stuff like that. Depending on what you're doing, maybe you can get somebody who has tons of money like Infoway to pay for it for you. Um, or your organization or whatever, um, but if you're just wanting to do some playing on your own, uh, you can get a free license to do that, messing around and playing yourself. Um, and I'm not gonna say too much more about that because getting into it in detail would have taken another hour um, and we don't have that. So instead of doing that, I'm gonna pause and we got about 12 minutes left for questions. So ask questions about questionnaire, ask questions about Simplifier, ask questions about Fire in general. Um, I can talk about the working group meeting last week. I, I can talk about whatever you want. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, let's see if anyone's got any questions first. 